welcome to Paula Memorial on this first Sunday in Advent. I'd like to invite Melissa and her family up to light the first candle. You'll find the response on the PowerPoint. The prophets call and the psalmists sing to announce that hope comes from God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. We shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The world cries for justice and transformation. Advent summons us to watch, to wait, and to hope in the destruction of the current order is the promise of a new order beyond our imagination. Signs of hope are all around us. If we have the patience to wait and to see them. Holy are you, source of all new life among us. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ comes, comes as, as the, hope the hope of, of the, the world. world. We join with all creation and lift our hearts in joyful praise. We light we this, this candle, candle to bear, bear witness hope. hope. I invite you to remain seated as we sing the first verse of our Advent hymn, Hope is a Star. Before we go into our opening hymn, I'd like to invite the children and anyone else who's taking part in the Advent pageant to please head downstairs. And the rest of the congregation, I'd like to invite you to stand and sing our opening hymn, hymn number 126, On Jordan's Bank.
let us come before our God and let us pray. In the light of the first Advent candle, we gather our hearts before you today, loving God, ready to hear anew the story of the birth of your only Son, ready to be reminded of the wonderful gift you first gave us on that Christmas day so long ago, and ready to celebrate with all of creation that to us a child is born and for us your Son is given. And so we joyfully come before you this morning, ready to lift our voice in a prayer of adoration for the good news that you are a God who keeps his promise. For out of love you sent us your only Son. Holy Lord, as we start our Advent journey this day, remembering the great way you prepared the way for the birth of Jesus, for our Christmas story does not start in Bethlehem, but instead centuries before the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary. As in the past you gave your chosen prophets a promise of a lifetime. For while your people struggled in the time of exile, you let them know that you were hard at work to prepare the way for their great homecoming. For not only would you give your people a great leader, one that would not care for earthly glory, but instead we would be the one who would become the good shepherd, who would put the needs of the flock before his own. We praise you, Lord, for the great comfort your words gave to your people, as they were to have hope that one day they will be restored and brought back to the promised land. And we continue to praise you, loving God, for the good news that we today have inherited the same promise, that one day our world will be at peace, and one day we will dwell in your house forever. We praise you, mighty God, for when the time was right, you gave us Jesus, born of both the Holy Spirit and Mary, as Jesus chose to become just like us, so in return we could understand and know that our God understands what it is like to live in a world that is not perfect. We praise you, Lord, for the many lives that Jesus reached as he healed the sick, set people free from things beyond their control, and offered forgiveness of sin to all who were in need. We thank and praise you, Lord, that Jesus is still doing the same thing today for all who call out upon his name. We praise you that for our sake Jesus chose the cross so that we could be set free forever from the power of sin and death. And thanks to the promise of the empty tomb, we know that we're now able to live an abundant life, filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. For all these things and so much more, Heavenly Father, we joyfully lift up to you our prayers of adoration, as together we speak the words that Jesus taught us to say by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in faith, welcome to Paul Memorial on this beautiful first Sunday in Advent. I would like to extend the th my thanks and thanks of the congregation to the decorating committee as they once again have found a new way to transform our worship space, and we're so appreciative of it. You're invited to join us on Friday, December 22nd for a blue Christmas service. For those of you who may not have heard this phrase, it's a Christmas service where we prepare ourselves for the gift of the Christ child, but also gives us time to remember those who will not be joining us around the tree. So you're all welcome to come if you wish. Our memory tree is now out on the, right outside the sanctuary. You're invited to take an ornament and write the name of a loved one who has passed and place it on our tree of memories. With the weather getting, well, it was colder last week, we're collecting hats and mitts to support some of the children in our community who may struggle to keep warm during this coming season. So if you wish to make a donation to the mitten tree, it is in the parlor, and there is a place for you to place your offerings there. 
save the date as this coming Saturday we are having a poinsettia bazaar. Pollen will be having its own bake table. They are asking for all donations for the bake table to please be brought in by Friday. And if you're looking to get your, your picture with Santa, the bazaar is the place to go. So we hope we'll see you on Saturday. And join us next week on the 10th as the kids will be taking over half of the service with the presentation of the Christmas pageant. And just a reminder, in your bulletin has a list of all the important events that are going on during Advent, including Christmas Eve. We will be having what we will call Advent 4, which is the choir presenting a beautiful cantata for us on the 24th. And then at 7.30 p.m., we will be having one Christmas Eve service. And now I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 118, Hark the Glad Sound. be seated. It's now time for the children of God's children's story. Now you may have noticed we're missing a few people and that's because they're downstairs getting ready for next week which means we get to do the adult version of the children's story and it's a wonderful thing to be able to do because there is always more for us to learn and more for us to discover and because no one really wants to sit for a five-hour sermon I have to be really careful and fit what I can into the sermon, which means there's always something left on the cutting room floor. And today, you're going to be hearing about the birth of John the Baptist. I know, not the birth you were expecting. But he plays an important role in the coming of Christ. And you're going to hear about how Zachariah had the very worst thing ever happen to him. It's the very worst thing that can happen to any single minister in the world. He's told to be silent. Do you know how hard it is to be silent? Even those who aren't ordained or don't have a leadership role, how easy is it for you to be quiet? To not have the radio on, to not have the TV on, to not be humming to yourself just because silence is awkward. It's empty and it feels strange. And yet this is what the angel tells Zechariah you will be. And often when I read this, I think of it as a punishment because Zechariah didn't have the faith to believe that his wife, who was, well, to be honest, is described as two things, faithful and really, really, really old. He's told that he will not speak until the child is born. Could you imagine being silent for nine months? 
let alone can you imagine trying to explain to your partner why you are silenced for nine months. But the more I think about it and pray about it, I realize that it wasn't a punishment. Instead, the angel was giving Zachariah the time to be still and to listen to God's word. The Psalms tell us, be still and know that I am God. And it's something we need to remember because as wonderful and loud and exciting and full of everything Christmas and Advent season is, we're still invited by the Holy Spirit to be still, to be silent, to hear God speaking to us. Zechariah is given the gift of nine months to listen to God. We are encouraged during Advent to take nine minutes to listen to what God has to tell us, to step away from our busy to-do lists, our parties, our celebrations, and just be still and know that our God is Lord. And so I pray as we prepare ourselves to make our Advent journey, you'll take the time to follow in Zachariah's wake and be still and know that God is with you, not only during the season of Advent, but all the days that we have been blessed with. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as someone graciously reminded me, this is the first of the month, which means it is birthday church. So anyone who has a birthday, an anniversary, very heavy pockets full of change, I invite you to come up and all money that is donated to Birthday Church goes towards Presbyterian Sharing, which is the mission branch of our national church. And since I have a birthday this month, and so does Jonathan, I'm going to be the first one to add. pass every year, we have a designated amount for Presbyterian sharing. And last year, we set it at $4,000. I am happy to announce that this year, we are sending Presbyterian church, or Presbyterian sharing over $4,000 to support the ministry. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name's Ann McLaughlin, and first what I'm going to do is read the mission moment, but before I do that, I just want to remind people that we have our uh, faith community action uh, group is meeting on Monday evening 
at 7 o'clock in the parlor, and we are always looking for new members. So if you're hearing God's call to uh, work in, in terms of uh, our mission projects that we're doing over the next few months, we would, I would in invite you to come out for that. Our uh, mission moment comes, we're talking about some of the programs that are provided by the Presbyterian World Service and Development. And this is one of the two uh, branches of mission work that our national church does that we support through our donations. And this is our uh, non-government organization. So it's not looking at converting people, it's looking at living our faith through our actions in our community and in our world. In Malawi, Jennifer joined a program for orphans and vulnerable children to supported by PWS and D. When she was in grade five, Jennifer lost both of her parents to HIV and was cared for by her great aunt. Jennifer is also HIV positive and is undergoing treatment. Through the OVC program, Jennifer received training in tailoring as well as beekeeping. Now, at 19 years of age, Jennifer has just had her first honey harvest, yielding five kilograms of honey, which she sold to buy food. Jennifer now dreams of volunteering with a local tailor, hoping to secure a paid job in the field. With the skills she learned from this program, Jennifer is able to live positively with HIV and earn a livelihood to support herself. Now I'd ask you to bow our heads as we pray, pray the prayer of illumination. Dear God, we take a moment now to reflect on the highs and lows of our past week. As we read these scriptures, help us to see how they relate to our highs and lows. Open our minds to the possibility that they will offer us different ways of thinking and that they will guide us in the week ahead. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 to 9, reading from the New International Version. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Now turning to the New Testament, from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. The birth of Jesus, sorry, the birth of John the Baptist is foretold. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abiah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, 
according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be feel, filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Thanks to God for the opportunity to hear his word.
you, choir. That was beautiful. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Now, this probably wasn't the angelic message you were expecting to hear this morning as we take our first steps towards that little town in Bethlehem. But it's important for us to remember that there's more to the story of our salvation than just Mary and Joseph and no room for the expected mother. Instead, the story of the birth of Jesus starts long before Mary heard the good news and Joseph had doubts about what was yet to come. Truthfully, our story starts long before Zechariah enters the temple to offer incense. For our God was hard at work to prepare the way for the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. As we make our pages our way through the Old Testament, we can see the many ways that God was seeking to prepare his people for what was yet to come. The prophets of old speak boldly about the coming of Emmanuel, the one who will set the prisoners free, bring the exiles back home to be with the Lord once more. Even the rituals that were performed in the temple were centered around the idea of sacrifice that was used to wash away the sins of the people. God always had a plan to bring about the salvation of his beloved people. And that plan was always going to be the sending of his only son to come and live among us. And so throughout the ages, God started to set this plan in motion, hoping that the, when the time was right, the people would be ready to receive the great gift that God had prepared for them out of love. One of the ways that God was going to prepare his people for Jesus was to send out a herald before him. Now, for those of you who may not be as up-to-date about medieval history, as it was a common conversation in my household, a herald is someone who goes before the king to let people know the king would soon be entering the room or the town. Their job was to warn people that something exciting is going to happen. Sort of the best modern-day example I can give that we're all familiar with is think about the flyers that end in your mailbox every week, letting you know that this exciting Black Friday Part 2 is coming and you need to come to the store to check it out. Not the exact comparison, but a modern-day equivalent. And we know from our reading in Scripture that God chose John, who would soon be known as the Baptist, to be his herald, to become for the nation of Israel a new Elijah, one who was promised to help prepare people for the coming of the Lord. And so it's fitting at the start of our Advent journey. We hear the story of the birth of the one who was sent to prepare the way. Now John's birth is as unexpected as Jesus' own. For the very first thing we learn about his soon-to-be parents is that they are both very old. And to point out, old in biblical terms means anyone over 60. So it's safe to say that very old probably meant 65, closer to 70. And up to the birth of John, they were never able to have children of their own. I'd like you to imagine what it would be like to be close to 70 and being told you're going to have a child. What would your first reaction be? How would you feel telling your family? Many of us would not be singing God's praise finding out we were to have a child at that age. But the fact they were never able to have a child hung heavy in the relationship. Many people in our world today understand firsthand the sorrow that Zachariah and Elizabeth must have felt during their lives, as month by month they were not able to carry a baby to term or even get pregnant themselves. 
The statistics from the Mayo Clinic states that there is on average 10% of the world's population that for one reason or another cannot give birth to a biological child. Think about that for a moment. That out of 100 people, 10 of them might not be able to make their dream come true of holding a biological child of their own. Even today, with all the medical advances we've had, not everyone is able to have a child that longs to. And now imagine for a moment how painful it would feel knowing that you will not be blessed with a child and then knowing that the entire world around you would blame you for that fact. If you're able to imagine that, you might find yourself in the shoes of Elizabeth. As from a young age, she would have been taught that her role in life was very important. She needed to marry someone of the priestly line of Levi to support them during his service to the people of Israel. But above all, even supporting her husband, her job was to have as many male children as possible. Because Elizabeth is not only from the tribe of Levi, which was the only tribe in all of Israel where its members could become priests, she could trace her bloodline all the way back to Aaron, the, the brother of Moses. And it was her job to make sure that bloodline was passed to the next generation. So you can imagine the tension she would have been under as month after month there was no child and year after year who, her womb remained empty. It's easy to picture Elizabeth and Zachariah praying each night to God for a child and their disappointment when their prayers went unanswered. And I can't help but wonder how painful it was when they gave up on those prayers. For they were no longer as young as they once were, and they believed they had grown far too old for a child to be conceived. This also makes me wonder if Zachariah knew right away which of his prayers had been answered. As over the past some 60 to 70 years of his life, he must have raised millions of prayers to the Lord in his role as a priest, and in his own personal life. After all, if an angel of God suddenly appeared before you today and said, your prayers have been answered, would you know which one he was talking about? Was it your prayer when you were five and really wanted a pony? Was it your prayer for there be peace to be found in Israel and Gaza? Or was it a prayer that someone would be healed? We speak a lot to God, so much so it's hard to know which prayer could be answered. And I don't think Zachariah knew right away which prayer the angel was talking about, because he was in shock. All of a sudden he's told, your wife shall conceive and bear a child. Because his first answer is the one that, well, to be honest, many of us would give in the same situation. No thanks. Th this cannot happen, don't you see? I am an old man, and my wife, she's an even older old woman. Can you imagine us raising a child at our age? We'd bend down to play with them and never be able to get back up. How on earth could we deal with any child, let alone one who is destined to do such great things? But the angel of the Lord would not be moved on this matter. Instead, telling the bewildered Zechariah that this is what the Lord has planned, and this is how things will unfold. Elizabeth will give birth to a child, and you will name him John, and he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. And until he is born, you shall remain silent. And then the angel was gone and Zechariah found he could not speak a word. 
I've often wondered in the aftermath of Zachariah returning home how on earth he told Elizabeth about what was to happen. It would have been one epic game of charades, trying to explain that she would still have a ch soon have a child and to let them know what God has planned for the both of them. But when the time was right, Elizabeth gave birth to a son, and Zechariah was finally able to break his silence and proclaim that the boy's name would be John. And now the stage was set for another woman to be visited by the angel Gabriel, who would be told that she too would give birth to a son who would change the world as we know it. But Mary's story will have to wait for another day, as today in the light of the candle of hope, we're called to remember the good news that was first given to Zachariah, but also to each and every one of us. Do not be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. This is the good news of this most holy season, that our God has a plan, a plan to bring about the salvation of you and I. And that plan was and is Jesus. For our God has heard each and every one of our prayers, from our joyful shouts of praise to our broken hallelujahs when we ask God to bind up our broken hearts. Our Lord hears every single prayer and out of love answers them, even the prayers we're no longer able to give voice to, just as he did for Zechariah and Elizabeth, so that we today will always have hope, hope in this world and hope in the one still yet to come, because we know that God has a plan for us, a plan for our salvation, our transformation, and for the transformation of the world around us. So do not be afraid, for God has heard our prayers, and out of love he has given us his Son. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we're reminded of the gift that God has given to us, we're invited today to come to the table that he has provided. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit at the table in the kingdom of heaven. We do not own this table, for it belongs to the Lord, and in his name we invite you. Come not because you have earned a spot, but because out of love God has prepared one just for you. Come not because we're strong, but because we need the life-giving gifts that can only come from our great creator. So come to the table, you who love the Lord a little and long to love him more. Let us lift up our voice in praise as we sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 543. Here, O my Lord, I see.
Let us pray. Creator God, it is you who has called us to this table from the wilderness of our daily lives to meet with you once more, just as you called your people throughout the ages when they wandered in the wilderness with Moses and Aaron. Like them, we come to your table, loving God, to be fed by the bread of heaven once more, for we confess that we are in need of that same bread, so that we may continue to grow into the people you know we can be, those who dare to work in your vineyard and to help prepare the way for your coming kingdom of heaven. This morning we follow the call of your spirit and come before you just as we are, hearts full of joy and sorrow, ready to be healed, ready to receive your love and grace with open arms, and then ready to be sent out to serve in your most holy name. So we thank you for this moment when your grace becomes visible, as through your love and mercy we're made whole once more. Heavenly Father, on this first Sunday of Advent, we give you thanks for the gift of your only Son, Jesus, who came to live among us, laying down his glory and instead choosing to pick up a cross for our sake. We thank and praise you, Lord, that Jesus came to show us the way to come closer to you so the, and the people that you love as he healed our wounds and set us free from all that once held our hearts and voices captive. We thank you, Lord, for the many teachings of Jesus that have shown us how to live as your people as he challenged us to love as you love, to see the world not as it is, but how it could one day become. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus came to show us that love, your love, has the power to set all captives free and to forever defeat the power of death itself. For out of love for us, Jesus chose the cross and the grave so that we in turn could choose everlasting life in his name. For this reason, we rejoice and celebrate the feast with him, who broke his body for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. On the night when our Lord was betrayed, after supper he took the meal, or he took the bread, and after giving thanks he raised it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, and having blessed it, he said, This cup is a sign of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Therefore, in remembrance of the grace so freely given to us through the acts of your Son, Jesus Christ, we set aside this bread and this juice from common use and give them as a sign of your many promises, given to those who you call to be your own. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and juice, so that we who share the feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Here we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. In your mercy, accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Fill us with eternal life so that we may be your faithful people until we serve with you in glory, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. O oh, glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. Brothers and sisters in faith, we at Paul and here practice an open table, so all are welcome to receive. In addition to the normal elements of bread and juice, there are on the, wine, on the juice trays the pandemic supplies, so if you need to have a gluten-free communion, please take one of those. Come taste and see that the Lord is good.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And after supper, he offered the cup. the blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for this moment around your table, the way we're united with your people worldwide, as we are restored by your grace and empowered once more by your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would send us out in your name, ready to allow our worship and work to be as one. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we respond to the gift that God has given to us with communion by responding with our tithes and offerings. And as this is Sunday of Advent, we are being given a special gift as George shares his gift of music with us.
godson when time was full he would shine his light in the darkness he said a virgin would conceive and give birth to the promise for a thousand years the dreamers dreamt and hoped to see his love the promise showed their wildest dreams had simply not been wild enough the promise showed their wildest dreams had simply not been wild enough the promise was love and the promise was life the promise meant light to the world living proof jehovah saves for the name of the promise was jesus the faithful one so time was full, the ancient pledge was honored. The God, the Son, the incarnate one, his final word, his own son, was born in Bethlehem, but came into our hearts to live. What more could God have given? Tell me, what more did he have to give? What more could God have given? Tell me what more did he have to give? The promise was love and the promise was life. The promise meant light to the world. Living proof, Jehovah saves for the name of the promise was Jesus. At last the proof Jehovah saves for the name, the promise was Jesus. Heavenly Father, we ask that you multiply these gifts given in your name. May they serve the, your needs. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we ready ourselves to go out into the world, we will go out singing our first Christmas hymn of the season, because we are pointing towards Christmas, hymn number 148. And just a reminder, there is a time of fellowship in the upper hall after the service.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.